Hello, I'm Anthony. Today I'm going to give you a walkthrough of Archuria's latest Reverb product. Here we've got the LX24, which is modelled on the Lexicon 224 from 1978. For about uh, 10 years, through the late 70s and early 80s, this was one of the go-to studio Reverb units of choice. And today we're going to have a walk through this unit and figure out how it works. Now at its core, the LX24 is eight reverbs in one, and we have these things called algorithms. At the moment, we've got the small hall B algorithm. I'm going to get this drum uh, beat going in the background, and then I'll change some of these settings over the top and talk about what's going on. So at the moment, I've got a nice, simple, clean reverb. If I just bypass it, Let's start having a look at some of these controls. I'll bring it in and out as I talk over the top of it. We've got two different uh, primary frequency ranges for the reverb, bass and mid. Fundamentally, you set a decay time, which is the length of the reverb from the decay control here. If I pick one of these controls up, watch the digital display, you'll get a little red dot telling you the context of the number. So because I just picked up the decay slider, it's telling us that we've currently got 1.8 seconds of reverb uh, on this unit. Now that's an overall decay setting, but then we've got independent control of the bass frequencies via our bass offset. So I'll pick up the bass offset slider and you can see at the moment the bass frequencies are slightly boosted. So whatever this value is set to, we'll leave it at 13.8, that's the bass values, the bass frequencies are going to be 13%, 13.8% longer than the standard decay time. We determine where that crossover point is using the crossover slider. If I pick that up, now you can see our crossover is currently set to 420 hertz. So having described those three values, I'll get the thing up and running again. And now we're going to take a different perspective of those different values. I'm going to jump over to the advanced view. You can see those three values in this base offset value, the decay slider on the left hand side, and this slightly more complex um, setting, which is basically a dual control. Here we're controlling the overall decay. You can see 1.8 seconds and the crossover point. So this advanced view is showing you exactly the same features, exactly the same controls as in the main, the primary interface. So this is your classic, if you want to use, this was called the Lexicon Alphanumeric Remote Console, the Lark, this thing. Uh, and you know, if you want to play with it through that mode, you can. But if you switch to the advanced view, you're going to get exactly the same features, just in a more kind of modern interface. So I'll turn the rhythm back up and play with some of these values, and we'll hear the bass being accentuated and attenuated, and I'll play with the cutoff as well. There's the bass being boosted. We pull in the decay, decay town, so we've got quite a small snappy reverb time now. Let's go the other way, pull the bass frequencies down and accentuate the higher frequencies. So now we've got an overall decay of 5.2, but the bass frequencies have been heavily attenuated. So we've got this shelf, this movable shelf, and then a variable crossover point and dual decay slider. It's a really intuitive way of dialing in a crossover point on an EQ curve. So that's your bass frequencies and your mid frequencies taken care of. But what about, what about all the air stuff, all the fizzy high end? Well, that's controlled with our damping slider. This allows us to apply a low pass filter. If I set damping to maximum, the low pass filter is having basically no effect. And as I pull this down, we're gonna throw away more and more high-end fizz. Jump back over to the advanced screen and we'll see this in use. I'm just gonna to switch to manual mode for a moment so I can play individual bass notes. You'll get some of the noise of me hitting the key, but we can live with it. What we've basically got is you'll see a small kind of orange halo spread across the frequency range as we hear some of that high-end fizz, even on a kick drum. And up at the top here, we've got our damping control. If I pull the damping right down, you'll hear 
all of that high end stuff disappear. So everything in, everything out. You hear how much duller that is. All that high end fizz is gone. So this is our low pass filter. And this up here is our damping control. So between those four controls, we've got this effectively three band pseudo parametric EQ control, slightly unusual terminology, but once you get the grip of it and using the advanced screen is a really good way to teach yourself, kind of learn how all of those controls are interacting. You've got a really flexible three way EQ control over the entire reverb sounds. Don't forget, everything that we're doing here is only processing the reverb. The natural sound itself is coming in from another tr track. I've got the reverb set up on a send um, bus here. So we're only affecting the reverb of the sound. It stands to reason, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. The last two controls are classic reverb fare, and you'll see these in most reverb units. Pre-delay is an amount of time to wait before you hear any reverb at all. So there's no pre-delay there. You, the reverb basically happens instantaneously. Maximum pre-delay, there's now a delay of 152 milliseconds. It's still quite short, but it's actually really noticeable. If I get the rhythm up and running again, you'll hear that with a pre-delay, everything is kind of staggered. It's a very artificial effect, but has been used to great effect for, for many years. You get an extra kind of delay bounce on top of all of the natural characteristics of the reverb itself. And distance is how far away is the thing that we're listening to. Let's bring it really close to us. And now let's throw it deep into the distance. Now all of those controls, everything that we've talked about so far has been in the context of this primary algorithm. The LX24 has got eight algorithms and everything that we've heard so far has been the small hall B algorithm. The algorithm is the most important of all of the controls. Every algorithm has its own default values. So you can see that every time I switch to a vocal plate setting, it's gonna give us this set of basically kind of default characteristics. If I switch back to the small hall B, this is the default nature of what a small hall B reverb will sound like. I'll get the rhythm going again. We'll just quickly listen to each of the eight algorithms. Now, can you hear that quite grainy kind of metallic effect? Just bear that in mind. We'll have a chat about that in a, in a while. Acoustic chamber, this stands for. Percussion plate A. Small hall A. Room A. Room A is the simplest, kind of the cleanest reverb. If you want a really straightforward one, go for this. This last one stands for constant density plate. Jump over to the advanced view and you can see its full name. While we're here, I'll just explain these three settings up at the top. What we've been listening to so far is Vintage 24, which is the virtual analog emulator. So it's basically genuinely producing what the lexicon would have done, but with 24 bits. The original device was 12 bits. It had an, an additional two bits um, available to it for doing some um, frequency shifting, some kind of clever frequency shifting in the background, but fundamentally it was a 12-bit processor. It's going to be the, the, the grainiest because the, you're going to get quantization noise, which is a thing 12 bits just really isn't enough to do the job. But in 1978, it was the best technology that we had available to us. So this is the absolutely authentic Lexicon 224. Then we boost that up to 24 bits, which gives you a much higher quality definition. We're still going to have some artifacts due to the fact that this is emulating something that's over 40 years old at this point, but it is still going through the virtual analog emulator. And then modern up at the end is going to be the cleanest. So we're basically using the, the essence and fundamental kind of character, character of, the, of the device, including all of its algorithms, but it's no longer going through that virtual analog. So you'll get the cleanest sound. Let's have a listen to each of those settings. We'll start with the Vintage 24 and I'll just cycle through them quickly. Here it's much cleaner.
be the most colourful in terms of distorted. Let's get something a little bit more active. Being careful to control my volumes here. While I've been getting to grips with this thing, I've basically tended to stick in Vintage 24. I've never had any quantization noise issues that have been so egregious that I've felt I needed to switch to modern mode. So we'll leave it there for the rest of today. I'm going to switch back to the Room A algorithm now because it's the simplest sounding to my ears, the one with kind of least articulation, so that I can have a chat about some of these controls at the bottom of the interface. The Lexicon's capable of quite a, quite a grainy sound. It can be made to sound really quite artificial. The easiest way to really dial that in is with this diffusion control. So what diffusion does is basically smear out all of the, all of the various reverb tails. If I increase diffusion to maximum, which is 63, everything is going to be softened. It's like putting it through some sort of, you know, filter that, that smooths all of the edges out. So all of the sounds don't have any artifacts to them at all. On the contrary, if I pull diffusion all the way to its minimum, now, particularly with the bass drum, you can actually hear individual reverb tails. You can hear the, the kind of the grains of sound. And so that's a matter of choice. Do you want that kind of artificial sound? Because you have to bear in mind, this is artificial for a good reason. As we become increasingly capable of replicating something perfectly, we increasingly come to appreciate that perfect isn't necessarily the best. This device is still beloved because it has all of the colour, so you don't want to dial all of it out, but it's a matter of salt to taste. Now, diffusion is your primary control for controlling that level of granularity. And somewhere in the middle, in the 30s and 40s, you'll find that the sounds are smoothing out and getting kind of nicely diffuse, but you're still able to hear the characteristics because fundamentally you are blurring the sound, which means you're throwing away a lot of the clarity to it. So you want to make that decision as to where, you know, that cutoff point is. Now, on top of that, we also have this thing called decay optimization. This is one of those things that Lexicon provided to you, but said, basically, we've sorted this out. Don't worry about it. Each one of the algorithms has its own um, settings for all of these. So if I switch to constant density plate, you'll see 71137. Doesn't matter what preset I'm in. Every time I get back to constant density plate, 71137. So these values have been tailored to this and you could quite easily just never mess with these values and be perfectly happy. But decay optimization is all about controlling um, the diffusion according to how loud the incoming signal is. So it adds like a skin of clarity over the top of your diffusion setting, depending on the volume of the incoming signal. And you can adjust both of these values to get to that kind of level of smoothing or completely ignore it if you want to just basically hang off the algorithm. See, I've switched to small concept B now, 5 and 21 are the default values for that algorithm. There's also a second way that these algorithms can be optimized and it's the other two controls. Mode enhancement and pitch shift are also linked together. In fact, if you disable mode enhancement, I'm just gonna click on it, pitch shift disappears as well. So these two options are also linked together. Kind of curious that one and three are linked and two and four are linked, but you know, it is what it is. What mode enhancement does is to individually modulate the frequency of the individual reverb tails inside the algorithm by modulating them slightly, basically speeding them up and slowing them down. It's another method of diffusion. I like to think of it as diffusion controlling kind of the feedback characteristics of the reverb and mode enhancement controlling the modulation characteristics, in other words, the individual frequencies of the tails. Once again, you could never worry about this again basically setting these four values is going to allow you to determine how natural or artificial 
you want the reverb to, to sound. Mode enhancement is at its most intense in the low numbers. So mode enhancement one is the strongest modulation effect and pitch shift is at its most intense at its maximum. So if I push both of those to the extreme and boost my decay so that we've got quite a long tail, you can hear that pitch shift on the reverb as it tails away. Pull it down. If you want to cycle through the eight algorithms without resetting these defaults every time you change them, you can lock the algorithms in place. And now you can switch the different fundamental algorithms and those values will stay dialed in according to your kind of manual selection. Next, we've got some Archuria enhancements. All of this stuff at the bottom is additional to what the original lexicon had. We can uh, overdrive the incoming signal. Let's get our rhythm going again. Got a high pass. You can hear those low frequencies being increasingly thrown away now. So basically everything below 1727 is being attenuated. It's being attenuated by this much, 12 decibels per octave. You can make that slope steeper to really concentrate on that, uh, on that cutoff frequency. Then we've got three different effects units in the middle. I'll deal with Ducker first. I'm going to switch over to my vocal line here. Sorry if there's a bit of an editing blip here. Uh, I'm just re-recording this demonstration of ducking because my first one was rubbish. Okay, let's talk about ducking. I've switched to um, a vocal line. I've got a phrase um, from one of my songs uh, sung by my wife up here. And I'm going to use this to demonstrate the principle of ducking, which is pulling the reverb out of the way when it needs to get out of the way. Quite often when vocals are singing, while the singer's actually singing the words, you want to just suppress the, the reverb a little bit, have it not quite so dramatic. And every time they breathe or pause, then you have the reverb bloom into that space and just fill the gap. So I'll demonstrate that. Firstly, I won't turn the ducker on and we'll listen to the vocal line and then I'll bring it in and I'll show how it cleans up, how the ducker cleans up the sound while the singing and then lets it go during the silences. Painted from memory when days were long, lazy and carefree, drunk on mist and rhyme. So the reverb is there all the time. Now let's engage the ducker. And what we want to do is get the threshold to the point where when the vocalist is singing, you'll see this red line on the threshold, basically telling you that the signal is strong enough to, to activate the unit. And then the ratio is going to be quite severe to suppress the reverb during that period of threshold being met. When the threshold is no longer met and the signal drops below, then we're gonna spend this amount of time basically releasing the reverb back into the wild. Here we go. Dress like a new dawn of golden color, always the same song, sung with different lines. Hear how clear it is when it's being sung. Painted from memory when days were long, lazy and carefree, drunk on mist and rhyme. And then as you saw there during the demonstration, basically just adjusting, fine tuning that threshold and ratio. When do you want the effect to kick in? How, how brutal do you want it to be? The ratio is how brutal the attenuation is of the reverb while this criteria, when this criterion is met. And then the release is, after it's done, how quickly do you get back to doing the thing that you're doing in the first place? Now, all of that has been processing the main track. So that's the vocal basically suppressing itself. If I had that signal coming from an external source, maybe I wanted to suppress the vocals while something else was happening. Generally speaking, you want the vocals on top, but just by way of example, then you would um, engage external in, and now you'd be looking for a side chain. So in Cubase, for instance, you go up to the activate side chaining and in the setup side chain routing, I can accomplish exactly the same task. This is really going around the houses to accomplish the same job, but just for the purposes of demonstration. Here's me setting up a side chain input. 
So now I'm sending the lead vocal itself as a sidechain into the Ducker, and this will have exactly the same effect. Like a new dawn of golden colour, always the same song. And there you can sung see with different lines. That's a maximum effect. Painted from memory. When just the memory kind of blooms and the reverb comes back. Now back to past Anthony to carry on with the demo. Tremolo is quite a dramatic, well, I quite I like using it as a dramatic effect. I'm going to dial in a synced 16th and get the drum rhythm going again. And now you'll hear tremolo on the drum rhythm in time to the beat. Obviously, I've really accentuated this. You wouldn't normally have it quite this dramatic. You can also have a similar kind of effect on I've got an electric piano, really simple chord thing. So all of that effect is coming from the reverb unit. That's the electric piano clean. There's our tremolo. And finally, gate. Let's go back to drums to demonstrate the gate. Let's tighten those drums up. It's a pretty brutal gate. So this was just everywhere in the early to mid 80s. Kate Bush used it as well uh, on Hounds of Love. We got the Mother Stands for Comfort. Really heavily gated effect, wonderful sound. Let's jump back to the classic interface to finish off. I think this is a really lovely clean interface and a lot of that complexity, you know, I was saying you need never really worry about this number, don't worry about it too much. In the primary interface, you can't edit those numbers. So you basically get the buttons to turn this stuff on and off as a primary effect. But essentially, you're kind of encouraged to leave them alone. Play with the, the primary algorithms by all means and um, adjust to, to, to whatever your requirements are. But a lot of the stuff under the hood, you really never need to worry about it too much if you don't want to. Hope you found this video useful. If you did, please hit like. I'll see you again. Thanks very much.